Good day. It has been a constant topic or theme of this uh, channel that 2021 has, has witnessed a major shift in geostrategic power as the United States and its allies in the West have come to be confronted to an increasing degree by what is now clearly a rival economic, political and military bloc, which is the Eurasian bloc led by China and Russia. Those two countries, though not formally in an alliance with each other, are increasingly acting to all intents and purposes as allies, and they're becoming increasingly concerted and open about the extent to which they coordinate and cooperate with each other. And in fact, we've seen more recent developments on that front as well. There was a few days ago an announcement that the Russians and the Chinese are forging ahead with joint development of a large helicopter. This is a, this is a project that's been talked about for many years. Russians were rather sceptical about it because they already have their own helicop big helicopter, the Mi-26. The Chinese wanted to build a new such helicopter, um, apparently somewhat smaller than the Mi-26. They were keen to tap into Russian know-how in developing a helicopter of that sort and now an agreement to jointly develop and build that helicopter has been inked and will and will proceed. And perhaps more dramatically, we've had further news of another joint bomber patrol in the Far East with Russian and Chinese bomber planes, H-6 bombers um, from China, Tupolev 95 bombers from Russia. They've undertaken another joint patrol over the uh, northern northeast Pacific. But in a sense, that's also now been complemented by a further shift in economic power. And indeed, it is that shift in economic power that makes this shift in geostrategic power ultimately the uh, give it, gives it the, its ultimate significance. Obviously, the great event that has changed the international uh, situation over the last 30 years has been the runaway growth of the Chinese economy to the point where today in purchasing power parity terms it exceeds in size that of the United States with its manufacturing capacity being now much greater. And in fact, in aggregate, Russian and Chinese economic power and resources, including in technology, but also in natural resources, at least equals and perhaps even exceeds that of the United States and its allies in the so-called collective West, something which the United States and its allies in the West have never been confronted before. Now, there is another curious twist about all of this change, and it's the one that I'm going to focus on today in this programme, because Alongside that major shift in economic power, one of the other things that has happened, and it's actually been very sudden and very dramatic, is that there's been a shift in energy power as well. Now, the story of the last 10 years up to now was of the return of the United States to a position of oil and gas self-sufficiency, to the point where the United States was even talking about becoming an oil exporter. And this was based very much on the shale revolution in the United States. And throughout the time that this shale revolution was taking place, you got contradictory claims about it. You got people in the United States claiming that this was another example of American technical innovation and enterprise and that it would transform the geopolitical balance and would strengthen the geopolitical supremacy of the United States. And on the other hand, you've got the sceptics, those who'd said 
that the economics of the shale industry didn't really add up, that the oil and gas that was being produced seemed to be excessively expensive, and who were pointing also to the geological limits, the extent to which shale could continue to be produced, had its uh, um, finite points, and they were all predicting that there would come a point when this shale revolution would run its course and oil and production, oil and gas production in the United States would start to dip. Now, there's been a whole succession of events this year which rather point to the sceptics about this being right, though one must qualify this and say that it's not quite as straightforward a picture as the, as the one which the sceptics started uh, sought to draw. The fact is that the United States, the upward trend in oil and gas production in the United States, seems to have come to a stop, and there are now growing signs of an actual positive decline. And there was a long article about this in the Financial Times, and it speaks it's entitled Birthplace of U.S. Oil Boom a Decade Ago Shows Sign of Decline. Production in North Dakota's back and field is unlikely to recover to pre-pandemic levels. And then you read um, about how the back and oil field in North Dakota is struggling to recover from last year's market crash, even as crude prices have surged back to $80 a barrel. It reflects a broader slowdown in growth from America's oil patch as companies keep spending low in a bid to redirect the windfall of cash from higher prices back to shareholders. But analysts say the back end faces a bleak future after years of intensive drilling. Oil producers in the back end are now running into the geological reality that after a decade of rapid development, most of the best wells have been drilled. And the Financial Times quotes a uh, US energy analyst, Clark Williams Derry, as saying it helps to explain why the industry in the back end is sort of flatlined. And the article in the Financial Times goes on to say, the dwindling number of high quality wells left to drill, those that can produce high volumes of oil for relatively oil low cost, will make it difficult for back end producers to get output back to pre pandemic levels. And uh, um, the same analyst then goes on to say that compared that uh, the situation that today's best drilling drilling sites could start to run low within just two years and things really start to fall off a cliff in the middle of this decade. And if you go down further into the article, I'm not going to read the whole article, firstly because it's very long, but also because it's paywalled. The problems at the back end are apparently symptomatic of the situation in the larger US oil industry, specifically that part of the oil industry, which is based on shale, and which in fact has been the main driver in the increase in oil production in the United States over the last decade. And it turns out that the situation with the gas industries are not very much better. There are problems there also, and we learn from oilprice.com that the, some of these problems um, um, come from um, the fact that the US, the US shale gas producers um, last year um, faced by a collapse in prices, um, heavily hedged oil product uh, their, 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 their profits. They um, invested many of their profits in 2022 in hedging against a possible extension of the energy price collapse with the result that they're not making the kind of profits in 2022 that they might have been expected to make, despite the fact that energy prices in general 
have risen. And again, one gets the sense that this is largely a reflection of the underlying problems across the entire energy system, the energy economy um, across the entire United States. And to, to quote the article from oilprice.com, US gas producers are set to book billions of dollars in hedging losses next year because he they hedged most of their 22, 2022 production before the recent energy crunch caused grass prices to soar. The, an uh, the, uh, the analysis by Reistad Energy zooms in on a peer group of shale gas-focused producers that accounts for 35% of unconventional gas production and about 53% of shale gas production in the U.S., and uh, the reason behind the expected losses, these losses in 2022, in spite of rising prices, is that uh, the, the operators had already hedged more than half their 2022 production by the time they reported their second quarter results when tri prices at a, at a time when prices were trading much lower than their currently inflated levels. So by the end of September, as much as 64 of their projected production was hedged. And what in fact that tells us is something which is very important to understand about the shale industry, which is that because of the high cost of producing oil and gas, from shales, the industry is volatile. It survives on very tight profit margins, and that requires the industry to hedge heavily, much more so than producers of conventional oil and gas in the Gulf and in Russia and in other places need to do. So when energy prices crash, as they did last year during the worst period or the tightest period of the pandemic the uh, shale producers suffer very severe losses and they have to constantly try and hedge their hedge against uh, um, that sort of situation arising again in the future and that means that they have to commit a very high proportion of their already tight profits to doing precisely this sort of thing. Now, the result is that if prices, instead of going down, as was expected last year, go up, as is indeed the case, then they can find themselves in particularly awkward positions, which is what is happening to natural gas producers in the United States, those that depend on shale. So, the shale gas industry is also in a, under a squeeze, and the shale oil industry is also being squeezed further. And there are now growing complaints that the administration is adding to some of these problems. And we see this in terms of another article on oilprice.com, which it discusses the growing criticisms of the administration's energy policies. And the article, um, which is dated 14th November 2021, uh, is entitled Biden's baffling oil policy faces backlash from all sides. And the administration hardly planned for everything that happened this year. In fairness, no administration could have planned for it. Soaring oil and gas demand tight supply, rising prices fueling inflation that has quickly gone from nothing to worry about to the biggest worry for many. And then it goes on to say, yet that's not the worst of it for the administration. The president came into office with the pledge to set the United States on a course towards a lower carbon energy future. This would have been a challenging task even under the best of circumstances, the US being one of the biggest polluters in the world. With the energy crunch, the task becomes almost impossible. It is no wonder then that when the president started calling on OPEC 
to boost oil production, nervous about rising gas prices at American filling stations, he instantly attracted accusations of hypocrisy. After all, he was pushing an energy transition agenda. He was clearly not in favour of boosting domestic oil production. And one of the first executive orders he signed was the one that killed the Keystone XL pipeline. The White House's climate envoy, John Kerry, got asked about the president's energy policy at the COP26 summit in Glasgow last week. How could the president urge OPEC to pump more oil while campaigning for the phase-out of fossil fuels? The media asked Kerry. And Kerry replied, he's asking them to boost production in the immediate moment, and as the transition cuts in, there won't be that need as you deploy the solar panels, as you deploy the transmission lines, as you build out the grid. And... Um, and uh, then we have um, uh, further comments that on the surface it seems like an irony, uh, but the truth is everyone knows that the, uh, that idea that we're going to be able to remove, remove to renewable energy overnight, it's not rational. And that's apparently said by no less a person than Kerry himself. So we have a strange situation where one at the same time, the president wants to phase out fossil fuels. At the same time, he's having to talk up, talk up the need for more production of fossil fuels from OPEC. And there's even now d discussion in Congress of apparently be bringing antitrust action against OPEC on the grounds that it's our cartel once more trying to extend uh, U.S. legal jurisdiction. To other, to other nations in a way that was certainly not be well received in places like Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. But we have all of this going on, but perhaps the biggest story is not, for me at least, the contradictions in the administration's energy policy, though they have no doubt made what was already a difficult situation worse. It is, as I said, that shift in the balance of power. And that has been highlighted, obviously, in part by the president's demand or request to OPEC and, by the way, also to Russia to increase oil production in order to increase energy costs. But there's been another interesting aspect towards, towards all of this, which is that as the president and his administration struggle to bring the inflation tiger out of control and look hard to try and persuade the markets to start to lower energy prices as something which has to be done in order to bring energy prices under control, the United States, the president, have had to reach out to the United States' two great geopolitical adversaries. One is China, which is now, along with the United States, um, in fact, more than the United States, today the greatest, world's greatest energy consumer and is becoming increasingly the world's swing energy importer. And the other is Russia, which is increasingly becoming the world's swing energy importer exporter. Both of these countries are, of course, as discussed, geopolitical rivals of the United States. Now, the outreach to China is a particularly strange one, because, of course, when the administration came into office, it seemed to be identifying China as the great geopolitical rival it talks about intense competition with China on those issues where the interests of the United States and China supposedly don't align. And I've discussed in many programmes that what that in effect means is that the United States seeks China's cooperation on issues which concern the United States, but is much less interested in cooperating with China on those issues which concern China and seems completely blind 
or indifferent to China's red lines. And energy has now turned out to be a prime example, because one of the factors that has been driving up energy costs, world energy costs, has been the fact that China, which is also trying to carry out a transition from fossil fuels, found itself short this year in terms of energy. And as its economy has reopened following the pandemic, it has become a voracious uh, importer of oil and gas, liquefied natural gas from North America, and by the way, increasingly also from Russia, uh, pipeline gas from Russia, oil from the Gulf, oil to some extent from Russia, coal from Russia, and other places like South Africa as well. And the Chinese, these steps that the Chinese have been taking, even as parts of their in economy have faced rolling blackouts, has of course had a major upward uh, pressure on energy prices. So the president, worried about the inflation that the rise in energy prices is causing, has been trying to get the Chinese to agree concerted steps with the United States to try to bring the energy situation, the energy price situation, under control. Now, the president, the administration, recognise that the Chinese are not going to reduce their demand for energy. What he is hoping to do is to get the Chinese to agree to a concerted action with the United States whereby both China and the United States simultaneously release oil from their respective strategic reserves in order to bring down energy prices, specifically oil prices, which are the prices which underpin energy costs. And the president has been talking about this. It was discussed by um, Secretary Blinken just uh, just in a call just before the summit meeting between President Xi and President Biden, the virtual summit meeting, uh, Blinken uh, called Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and it's now known that he broached this idea, and it turns out that it was also something that the president talked about with President Xi Jinping over the course of their virtual summit meeting um, a few days ago. The Chinese, as it turns out, have been unresponsive. But all this talk of a possible concerted move by the US and China to release oil from their strategic reserves, that has had a prob probably temporary effect of um, reducing oil prices. Though it's difficult to believe that this will continue for very long, because with the Chinese proving unresponsive to these US overtures, the prospect of that concerted action, as the prospect of that concerted action by the US and China to balance the oil market fades, the likelihood is that oil, oil uh, prices will start to rise again. And in fact, one effect of all this talk about the US and China working together to um, release oil from their strategic reserves has been that the OPEC producers have responded by actually cutting oil production in, in, in face of the administration's demands to increase it. It seems that OPEC, at least for the time being, would rather see prices, oil prices rise, than oil prices fall. And if the United States and China were to release oil from their strategic reserves onto the oil market, OPEC seems to be hinting that it might take action in that case to reduce production in order to balance the oil market at a higher level instead of a lower one. So it's quite extraordinary to see how this is happening, how the United States has had to reach out to China, or has been trying to reach out to China for help 
with the general inflation crisis that's now hitting, of course, the United States and indeed the whole world, and which is causing the president's poll ratings to fall and, uh, and is finding that he's having to put the policy of the administration of confronting China to one side, at least on this specific issue, because of the hope of getting Chinese cooperation in order to get this help from China that the United States is seeking on oil prices. Now, it's possible that the Chinese might, in their own interests, eventually agree to this step, but I can see reasons why they might not, and I suspect that this is something that's going to result in some quite careful thinking in Beijing. On the one hand, the Chinese probably do want to see oil prices fall. Why wouldn't they? As I said, they're a major consumer of oil. On the other hand, they are very well aware of the potential cr uh, crisis between the United States over Taiwan. And I suspect that with lots of talk on the part of the United States about the United States imposing some kind of blockade of China in the event that there was such a crisis, I suspect that the Chinese would prefer at the moment to keep their reserves full rather than put themselves in a situation where um, they might draw down their reserves, find themselves in a uh, crisis with the United States, with the United States imposing a blockade upon them and China finding itself short of oil. So I suspect that there is that strategic consideration which is making the Chinese somewhat reluctant to um, go ahead and produce, uh, release oil from their reserves um, at this time because, as I said, I don't know, think that they necessarily trust what the United States is going to do over Taiwan, over other issues going forward. But I suspect that there's another even more pressing factor on the part of the Chinese, which might disincline them to take the step which the president wants them to take, which is that I suspect the Chinese say to themselves that what the U US is proposing, which is ultimately a non-market, anti-market intervention is only going to drive down prices for a short time. The trend is for prices in the United States, energy prices to rise. And all that would happen if China released oil now is that OPEC would cut production. Oil prices would then start to rise again. Chinese oil reserves would become depleted the effect of the oil price fall would be temporary. And then when China needed to replenish its reserves, it would have to do so by buying oil at a higher price than it would otherwise do. And the Chinese who are exceptionally tough-minded uh, about these matters and who make these calculations extremely carefully, I would have thought that that would disincline them to release oil from their reserves at this time. Having said that, it's not something that I'm going to completely discount. There are no doubt other calculations that might point in other directions. And certainly, as I said, the Chinese would probably welcome lower oil prices. I suspect this is something that's been much discussed and talked about in Beijing, in Zhongnanhai, the leaders' compound, in Beijing with lots of discussion with energy experts and with industry experts to see what China should or should not do and whether, in fact, if China is going to release oil from its reserves, whether doing so in concert with the United States would be a good idea. Anyway, as I said, we'll see what happens. The other side of the picture is perhaps even more interesting, and that's the US outreach to Russia. Now, it's one of the things that perhaps people are not aware of, 
But U.S. oil imports from Russia have been steadily growing throughout this year, ever since the new administration took office. At the very same time that shale, uh, oil and gas is um, running down and liquefied natural gas exports from the United States have also been running down. And such as they are, they've been heading east towards Asia. Even as that's been happening, the United States has been quietly increasing the amount of oil it buys from Russia. In August, the Russian news agency TASS reported that Russia had become the second biggest exporter of oil to the United States after Mexico. That's quite a shift. Now, it needs to be said that the actual volumes for the moment are not enormous. The United States remains a very large uh, uh, producer of oil and gas and is still able to meet m m many of its own needs. And um, Russian oil exports to the United States are perhaps not to be compared to those from Mexico. But nonetheless, it is a sign of things to come. Now, it has several explanations. One of the explanations is the one which I spoke about earlier, the decline in the shale industry, the struggles of the shale industry in the United States, struggles which may have their particular issues at the moment, which might be temporary, but which nonetheless seem to prefigure a general decline in the shale industry in the United States. But there is one actual decision that the United States took, which I think is in fact of fundamental importance, but which is of course scarcely ever debated or discussed. And that is that the United States, some years ago, when it began to fall out heavily with the socialist government in Venezuela, essentially stopped importing oil from Venezuela. Now, there are many problems in the Venezuelan oil industry, and that's not a topic I'm going to discuss now. But suffice to say that Venezuela is a major producer of heavy crude, uh, of which the United States was a major importer. And with the United States no longer buying this heavy oil, heavy crude from uh, Venezuela, it's had to look to elsewhere for countries that can provide heavy crude to replace the heavy crude that the United States could previously imported from Venezuela. Now, I ought to say that um, crude comes in oil, Crude oil comes in various forms. There's heavier versions. There's lighter versions. All of them have their uses. You can't simply substitute one for the other. So taking Venezuelan heavy crude out of the equation me meant that the United States couldn't simply import lighter crude from, say, Nigeria or Saudi Arabia. It had to find somewhere else to buy heavier crude from. And of course, it's had to turn to Russia. And that's why one reason why imports of um, oil from Russia have gradually grown. And perhaps there's an even weirder twist to this, because there's just been a article in Bloomberg, which refers to the fact that there's now four Russian tankers steaming for, towards the east coast of the United States with diesel oil. Now, diesel oil is, a, is obviously a form of refined oil, and it suggests that the United States refining industries are having problems. And it's really quite surprising that the United States is now no longer importing just crude oil from, Saudi, from Russia, it's also importing refined oil from Russia as well. And one wonders what lies behind that. So we see a situation 
where the United States, from having boasted to itself that it was on the cusp of achieving energy self-sufficiency, finds itself no longer in that position of self-sufficiency, or at least not in quite that position of self-sufficiency that it imagined it had achieved. And faced with rising energy costs uh, it, and perhaps possibly shortages, not just shortages of crude, but it turns out even of refined oil in its own uh, country, the United States is perforce having to turn to its geopolitical adversaries, to China and Russia. It's having to ask the Chinese for help to balance the oil market, the energy market, by trying to get the Chinese to agree to a concerted move to jointly release oil from China's and the US's strategic reserves at one and the same time. And it's having to turn to Russia to import not just crude oil, and specifically heavy crude oil, but even refined oil, in this case diesel oil as well, which does beg many questions about the overall state of the energy industry in the United States. Anyway, it's a shift. And one does wonder how far this will all go. Because at the moment, it's clear that the United States, the government of the United States, the president, continue to remain deeply committed to their carbon-free future. But as, Sec uh, as, as, as Mr. Kerry has admitted, for the time being, dependence on fossil fuels remains extremely great. And the problem is that the control of the areas which produce those fossil fuels are increasingly falling under the control of the US's geopolitical adversaries. It's not just that the Chinese, for example, uh, the United States has to reach out to the Chinese in order to try to balance out the oil market with them because China is the major oil and gas importer at the moment. It's also the case that Russia is gradually tightening its control of the natural or the world's natural gas industries. And at the same time as all of these moves have been happening, we learn that the Russians have now made a major move to tighten their position as the dominant producer and exporter of natural gas by developing by agreeing a major natural gas deal with Iran. And the article appears, the, the confirmation of this appears in an article again on oilprice.com. Russia's biggest move yet to take control of the European gas market. And we then lead, lead a deal finalized last week to develop Iran's multi-trillion dollar new gas discovery, the Chalice Field, We'll, sh we'll see Russian companies holding the major share in it, followed by Chinese companies, and only then Iranian ones. Sources close to the deal exclusively told oilprice.com. This is despite Chalus's position unequivocally within the Iranian sector of the Caspian Sea, over which the Islamic Republic has complete sovereignty. Billions of dollars in additional capital investment are scheduled to come from financial institutions in Germany, Austria and Italy, as the indications are that the size of Chalus's gas reserves are even greater now than initially thought. According to one of the senior Russian officials involved in negotiating the deal, this is the final act of securing control over the European energy market. And then uh, we then continue to read, in context, the wider Caspian Basin's area 
including both offshore, onshore and offshore fields, is conservatively estimated to have around 48 billion bat barrels of oil and 292 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in proven and probable reserves. Russia was instrumental in manipulating a change in the legal status of the Caspian Basin's area that meant that Iran's share of the total revenues from the entire Caspian site was slashed from 50-50 split with the USSR that it had enjoyed as from the original agreement made in 1921 uh, to include any and uh, um, before the chalice discovery, this meant that Iran would lose at least 3.2 trillion in revenues from the lost value of energy products across the, sh the shared assets of the Caspian Sea going forward. Given the latest internal use only estimates from Iran in this and in Russia, this figure will now be a lot higher. And we learned that previously the estimates of Iran and, Ch and Russia where the chalice contained around 3.5 trillion cubic metres of gas. This equated to around one quarter of the 14.2 trillion centimetres of gas reserves contained in Iran's supergiant South Pars natural gas field that already accounts for 40% of Iran's total estimated 33.8 trillion centimetres of gas reserves and about 80% of its gas production. Anyway, it then goes on to discuss that the deal has in effect meant that Gazprom will have overall responsibility for managing the chalice development and that the new stake means that Russia's Gazprom and Trasneft will hold a 40% share, China's uh, two big companies, CNPC and CNOOC, together a 28% share, and Iran's KEPCO a 25% share only. And as I said, the field will overall be managed by Gazprom, though KEPCO will nominally be ch in charge of Iran's own operations. So we have seen a major breakthrough in Russia's penetration of Iranian gas fields. Perhaps a more important point to grasp is that the involvement of Chinese oil energy major energy majors actually tells us where most of the production from Chalice and indeed from the energy the Iranian energy system uh, is going to go. Um, Oilprice.com talks about this being a uh, me mechanism for tightening. Russia's control over the European market, and it mentions the fact that there are German, Austrian, and Italian investors in these Iranian fields. But it's highly likely that the dominant move of this, of the gas from Chalice, and indeed of gas from Iran in general, is towards China. And the reason, almost certainly, why the Iranians have negotiated this deal with Russia is because obviously the Russians have the expertise in developing gas fields, expertise which is probably greater than Iran's, and they also have not just expertise in uh, producing this gas, getting this gas out of the ground, but in piping it um, over the enormous distances that would be needed but that this pipe, these pipelines that are going to be built, presumably, principally by Gazprom, to China, that these deals altogether form part of a major package of principally Chinese economic investment in Iran. So though in its detail, taken in isolation, this might appear to be an unfavourable deal for Iran. I suspect that overall, when you take into account all the various components, the economic investments from China in the Iranian economy, 
the energy investments by Russia in the, in the Iranian economy, and of course the arm exports deals from Russia to Iran, one will probably find that the Iranians, who are nothing if not tough negotiators, have probably got themselves actually a pretty good deal as well. But the important, the key point is that it is the Russians and the Chinese who are gradually gaining control, tightening their grip, together with Iran, on Iran, Iran's major natural gas and oil reserves. So it is a situation where we see that it is the US's geopolitical rivals who are gradually winning control of, uh, um, of reserves through diplomacy and negotiation, obviously, not through threats or war, but through tough negotiations, which are working out to their advantage. Now, natural gas is particularly important because as the president uh, seeks to pursue his policy of moving the United States towards a carbon-free future, and as the Europeans enthusiastically uh, uh, adopt the same policy, the reality is that f uh, what that will mean is that both the Europeans and the United States become increasingly dependent, at least in the short to medium term, on natural gas. There's been some talk about the United States and Europe building nuclear power stations to try to make up the difference. There are still major political objections to this, both in the United States and especially in Europe. It would make require a major shift in attitudes in Germany, for example. But assuming even that was possible, assuming the technologies for these small reactors that Rolls-Royce apparently are developing uh, um, are successful, we are still talking about decades before nuclear power comes on stream in anything like the necessary volumes. So, with coal apparently in decline, with oil becoming increasingly unattractive, if one wants um, to have, and if one wants to move towards a carbon-free future, with natural gas having a much smaller uh, um, carbon footprint than oil, and far smaller than coal, it means the reality is that we are the world is going to become more dependent over the next decades, at least the next two decades, on natural gas. And the Chinese and the Russians, perhaps the Russians especially, are gradually positioning themselves as the dominant player in this industry. They are in a position where they produce much of the gas, they export much of the gas, and they keep most of this gas for themselves. And the Russians, by the way, have a very ambitious program to upgrade their nuclear power industry. They've already actually got a very large and effective nuclear power industry already ongoing. And apparently they're planning to build 15 more nuclear power stations over the next decade. So they are well on their way to build the nuclear power stations, something that the Europeans and the Americans are only very gradually coming round to talking about. And I suspect the China it's the same case. And I also suspect that the Chinese are going to get help, technological help from the Russians to do it, though the Chinese are certainly in a position technologically to build nuclear power stations by themselves if they need to. So we are seeing a significant shift in the geopolitical balance when it comes to energy as well. The United States briefly imagined on the back of the shale boom that it was going to become the major energy player. It's clear that the shale industry, or at least it's becoming clear, that the shale boom gave the United States a 10-year breathing space and perhaps an illusion of energy self-sufficiency, which is gradually fading away. In the meantime, the Chinese and the Russians, with the Russians, by the way, having looked at shale, 
they have much larger potential shale fields than the United States does. But doing the sums and deciding that it didn't make much sense from their point of view, the Chinese and the Russians instead have moved ahead and are moving ahead to make the big decisions which will secure their energy future. Well, what will happen? The United States will pull through. It has an, is an enormous country. It has huge resources. It has tremendous pull. It has tremendous um, know-how in this industry. One way or the other, despite all the muddle and all the confusion that is so typical in the United States, they will pull through. But it's highly likely that they will pull through whilst gradually increasing their import of gas and oil from Russia. And who knows if that continues and perhaps continues to grow, then we will get into a position, not immediately, but perhaps in five or ten years, when the United States has to start talking to the Russians in a rather more polite way than it is doing at the moment. I would add that there is a bitter aspect to this issue because before the Ukrainian crisis, it was to the United States that the Russians were primarily looking to develop their big oil and gas fields in uh, the Arctic and in northern Siberia. The reason was that the Russians calculated that it was the United States oil majors, especially Exxon, that had the expertise, the necessary expertise to do this. And they were working towards setting up joint projects with, Ex with Exxon to develop these fields. 2014 came, the United States and Europe imposed sectoral sanctions against Russia, which included sanctions against investing in the Russian oil and gas industries. The Exxon deal was called off. The Russians developed these fields by themselves. And increasingly now, the Chinese are becoming, are investing in them. So it seems to me that in that, area, in that respect, the central sanctions have comprehensively backfired, at least in terms of the US's immediate energy needs. Anyway, it's possible that, as I said, in five or ten years, assuming this trend of importing more energy, more oil and gas from Russia continues, that the Russians will be, that the United States will have to gradually become a little more responsive to uh, um, uh, um, Russian um, political needs and red lines and things like that. Though one can't ever be sure of anything especially where the U.S. is concerned. But regardless, the U.S. will, I suspect, be able to pull through. Europe looks to be in a much deeper hole because, of course, it doesn't have the um, capacity to produce the uh, oil and gas to anything like the extent that the U.S. can still do. It doesn't have those uh, resources and it is becoming increasingly heavily dependent on importing oil and gas, especially natural gas. Its hopes one day of um, penetrating uh, the Iranian gas industry, um, achieving a European presence in the gas industry, have been defeated. The Russians have got there first, and it's likely that whether they like it or not, the Europeans will have to deal increasingly with the Russians for their natural gas needs. There's been much talk about Nord Stream 2 recently. There's been a lot of commentary about the fact that the German regulator has temporarily suspended certification of Nord Stream 2. I've done a programme about this on Locals. I personally think that this is a relatively minor affair. I think that this is part of an arrangement which the Germans and the Russians have made um, to build up this subsidiary in Germany, which, and I suspect, as I've said previously, that it was the Russians who probably asked for that delay 
until the subsidiary is up and running. So I don't actually put much weight in this. But to be truthful, Nord Stream 2 is certainly a bridge to the future. Sooner or later, it will be certified. And sooner or later, it will start piping gas. But perhaps the biggest story, the story of Chalus, the story of US imports, now extending to diesel oil from Russia, is that whether or not they like it, the Europeans are going to become more dependent, not less, on the Russians for their energy needs. And that is the shape of things to come. That being so irrespective, if you like, of whatever temporary spats and delays there are about Nord Stream 2. A major shift in the world geopolitical balance. We've not seen anything quite like this since the Second World War, when the United States and Europe previously imported oil and gas. They did it from their geopolitical allies in the Gulf. Now, for the first time, they're becoming dependent on the people, the Chinese, the Russians, to some extent the Iranians, who are their politic geopolitical enemies or whom they have perhaps unwisely described, decided to describe in those terms. Well, thank you for joining me for this programme today. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please don't forget to check out Alex's channel. You will find links below. Please also remember to check us out on our other platforms, First and Foremost Locals, where I publish videos uh, um, and also exclusive videos, and where I also now regularly do live streams, usually every Wednesday. And you'll find links below as well. Also, I would add that our community also publishes a lot of exclusive content on Locals. And you can also uh, uh, find us on other platforms, BitChute, Light Library, uh, Rumble, Odyssey, SuperU, and all the rest. And you can also support us, if you wish, via Patreon and Subscribestar, by going to our shop, buying the amazing Magic Mugs, you will find there our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, our hats, our hoodies and all the rest. And last but not least, if you like the, this video, please remember to press the like button and please also check your subscription to this channel. Enough from me today. Thank you very much for joining me again. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.